a press conference entitled Methane, New York's Dirty Addiction to Shale Gas. My name is Tony Ingraffi. I'm a professor, an older professor of engineering from Cornell University, and I'm the MC for this event. I'm going to have a few introductory remarks. I'm then going to introduce the two main speakers for the event, and then I'll manage the Q&A, a very active and exciting Q&A we're going to have after both presentations are completed. Uh, as I'm making these remarks, on this screen you're seeing a set of what I call the, uh, the methane vignettes. You're seeing them and hearing them. These are outtakes and videos taken by private citizens who travel all over New York and Pennsylvania, taking video, sometimes infrared video, of actual events of leaking and purposeful venting of methane directly into the atmosphere. We're holding this event today on the second anniversary of a very significant event in New York State. Two years ago, almost to the day, New York State decided to ban the development of shale gas in our state. And yet we find ourselves, as you're going to hear today, using more shale gas than ever. Events like this are happening with more frequency in our state and in Pennsylvania, from which we're demanding, New York State is demanding, more and more shale gas. And so at this point, some of you might be wondering, looking around the room, very few are wondering, so what's the matter with methane? Isn't it a clean bridge to a renewable future? Well, the answer to those questions uh, is going to be given by my colleague from Cornell University, Bob Howarth, a scientist and the principal author of a number of very important papers on the intersection of methane and climate change in the environment. Uh, the paper that we co-authored in 2011, I think it's safe to say, opened the floodgates to scientific inquiry into that very question. And so now we have undoubtedly in the literature proof that methane is not a good bridge fuel. It's not good for anything. The purpose of this workshop or this press conference is to let you know that we don't think the politicians are hearing the scientists. So how bad is this problem in New York State? Well, that problem, that, that question is going to be answered by our other speaker, Keith Shu, an engineer, an environmentalist, uh, a technical advisor to Oxigo, Oxigo 2000. I think you will agree that while you're listening to Keith, you will be astounded with the facts and figures he's going to give you on what New York State has been doing in the last two years with shale gas. And more importantly, he's going to tell you what New York State has not been doing because of its addiction to shale gas. So I'm going to end here. Uh, I'm going to let Bob come up and tell you why methane is bad and why methane is not a bridge fuel. And once again, I want to make sure you understand that please hold your questions till both presentations are over. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Tony, and thank you all for, for coming today. The context in which I want to talk about methane and shale gas is the event that happened in Paris uh, literally one year ago today. And that's when the United Nations Conference of the Parties 21 came together and the nations of the world agreed that we need to keep the planet well below 1.5 degrees Celsius in order to keep the risk of catastrophic runaway climate change uh, from getting larger. At 2 degrees Celsius, that risk becomes very, very high. So all of the nations of the world have now agreed to keep the planet well below 2 degrees C, and part of the message is we cannot do that without reducing methane emissions. Now this is a bit of a complicated slide, but what it's showing is the warming of the planet over the 20th century up to 2011, the squiggly line, that's the real warming. Uh, the last decades of the 20th century, the first decades of this century have been warmest. Uh, last year's the warmest ever. This year is uh, going to be a record to be warmer. You can see that the green reference line there is the rate of warming if we do nothing to control greenhouse gas emissions. And in a period of 6 to 10 to 12 years from now, we'll be at 1.5 degrees Celsius. And again, this is where the risk of runaway global warming becomes higher. We'll be hitting 2 degrees in about 25 to 30 years from now if we do nothing with greenhouse gas emissions. And that's a very, very dangerous temperature for the planet. The other three lines on this slide, the next one down there, where it says CO2 measures, is what would happen if the world societies were to aggressively control carbon dioxide, but only carbon dioxide. And because of lags in the climate system, we are still going to blow right through the COP21 Paris 
record temperature targets. Controlling CO2 cannot help us stay below those targets. The bottom two lines are what happens if we control methane and other things as well. But methane is the key to that. And since the climate responds much faster to methane, it is the only way we can keep the planet in a safe territory as we move ahead in the coming uh, decades. All right, this concept of bridge fuel, the idea that we continue to use fossil fuels, but we switch out coal, we switch in natural gas, and, and increasingly natural gas means shale gas, because more and more that's where our natural gas is coming from. There's some logic to this idea of a bridge fuel. And what I'm showing you here is that when you use coal, you produce more carbon dioxide to get the same amount of energy than if you're using natural gas. So that's good, right? Carbon dioxide emissions go down. The problem with this is that natural gas is methane, mostly methane. And methane is 100 times more potent as a greenhouse gas than is carbon dioxide. And so small emissions of unburned methane to the atmosphere are a huge dramatic problem. And increasingly, the problem is associated with shale gas. So what I'm showing you here is the total production of natural gas in the United States from 1980 up until about the present and projections from the government off into the future. Uh, the line there at the top is the total, and then we're breaking it down into conventional natural gas, which was virtually all of our gas through the 20th century and the first few years of, of this century, and increasingly the shale gas, which is now over 60% of our gas. Now, Tony and I, Tony mentioned this paper that he and I and Renee Santoro put out in 2011, and basically as the shale gas revolution is taking off, we took on the question, what are the methane emissions associated with shale gas? And no one had really asked that. The assumption is this is a good bridge fuel who's thinking about methane. We had reasons to believe that the methane emissions might be quite high, and I'm not going to go into the details of our first paper, other than to remind you again that natural gas is mostly methane, so small leaks matter, and we had reason to believe that shale gas was worse than conventional methane gas. And one of our major conclusions, we did the best job we could with the information that was available, five years ago, but the information was not uh, robust, not well documented. And so we said what really needs to be done is to get better science, more people out there in the field, objective scientists measuring what the emissions from shale gas uh, really are. And that has happened. I'm very proud to say that uh, ours was the first paper, 2011. There are now hundreds of papers on this topic. It's been an explosion of science. And a lot of it's pretty damning. I'm just going to give you one example. This is. I think the most important example, the scariest example, it's a little complicated, so bear with me. But this is a study published two years ago now. They're using satellite data because we can measure methane over the entire atmosphere of the planet from space. And so the upper plot here, we're looking from 2003 to 2012 over time, and what the average methane concentration is in any particular area and circumference of the planet, North Pole, Equator, and South Pole. And the redder colors means that the methane concentrations are going up. Blues, low methane, reds, high methane. So the take home message is that the methane concentrations increased a lot over this last decade or so. And it's mostly in the northern hemisphere. And when the authors of this paper looked in detail to see where this methane was coming from, the answer is it's coming almost entirely from the United States. So the United States is responsible for a huge increase in methane globally over the last decade. And when you look in detail down here, these are the plots, average methane concentrations in the atmosphere on the left there, 2006 to 2008 in the United States before the shale gas revolution, 2009, 2011 when things were first getting going. We don't have more recent data because the satellite is no longer in space, but you can see the colors are getting redder, there's more methane, and it's associated with the shale gas and shale oil regions in the United States. So the shale gas and shale oil revolution of the United States has had a global consequence on the amount of methane in the atmosphere. When we look at what that means in terms of the total greenhouse gas footprint, I'm showing you here uh, both carbon dioxide and methane emissions normalized to their equivalency of carbon dioxide. For coal, diesel oil, conventional natural gas, and shale gas, the orange color is the direct CO2 emissions, the red is what's going on with methane. That's the estimate from the satellite data that I'm showing you for shale gas. And the take home message is that shale gas is a climate disaster. It is no bridge fuel whatsoever. And finally, this is perhaps the most important message of this. This is a new study by Jim Hansen, who's uh, one of the world's premier climate scientists. This was published uh, just five to six weeks ago. Uh, 
Hansen again is showing us here the global trends in total amount of methane in the atmosphere. It increased from the 1980s. It was more or less level for a while, the early part of the century. It's taken off again circa 2008 or so and gone up. And again, that increase is due to shale gas and shale oil development in the United States. Hansen took it further. They modeled the consequences of this on global warming. And their conclusion is, is the incredible rate of global warming we've seen particularly over the last few years, which were not predicted by previous models, are largely the result of this increase in methane. So the take home message is shale gas and shale oil development in the United States is having a demonstrable effect on atmospheric methane, and that is causing the incredible rate of global warming we're seeing. The solution to slowing that rate of warming is to get rid of shale gas. So I'm going to finish with my part there. Again, methane is critical to reaching the targets that the nations of the world wisely set in Paris. I think New Yorkers need to wake up. We've banned shale gas, but we are using we banned fracking to produce our own. We are importing shale gas, and you'll hear more about that. And we need to take uh, responsibility for that. And with that, I'll turn it over to, to Keith. We'll give you the details. Thank you. Thank you. So, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk to you about what's actually happening here in the, in the great state of New York. Um, Okay, you have heard uh, the hype, you've heard the, uh, pro you've seen the promotional materials, you've probably heard the speeches. What is going on here in the state of New York to deal with our energy issue? Uh, you, you talk to the guy in the middle there, uh, Governor Cuomo, he'll tell you we are leading the way on climate change. Um, he will tell you that there is uh, groundbreaking activity going on today to meet, to address our, our climate issues. We have to tell you that the most groundbreaking activity that's actually occurring in the state of New York um, is the shattering of bedrock in Pennsylvania to fuel New York's growing addiction to gas. In the last 10 years, we've seen a massive growth in New York's use of shale gas for all purposes. And this is this picture displays it right here. Total use of gas in New York is up 18% in just five years, and that number is still growing. The number of gas customers people who use heating and so forth, um, has gone up dramatically. Uh, half a million customers have signed up in New York to be on gas in just the last 10 years. And by the way, that's more than the, the, the change for the entire rest of the country put together. So yeah, we're leading the way. We're leading the way, but we're leading the way toward more gas. That's the problem. The use of natural gas for electricity has nearly doubled in 10 years. Here's some statistics that show that. And it shows up with things that are being constructed as we speak. CPD power plant under construction. So when that, if, if that gets, a, gets built, it's going to be uh, pushing an additional 2 million tons of carbon dioxide into the air. When you add methane to the equation, you can double or triple that number. This is a fiction. This is a graph that basically tells you where where we stand in terms of our electricity generation, natural gas is winning by far. Look at the two reds, natural gas and renewables. We've got a long way to go on renewables. This is the reality of what's happening here in the state of New York. And it's not just what's happening now, it is what's proposed to happen in the future. This is a graph that comes uh, from information of the New York Independent System Operator. What this is telling you is that of the, in the queue for uh, NYISO right now, more, more than half of all new proposed generation is gas, or dual fuel, which is actually gas in the global bag backup, basically. And it, you know, when you look at this picture, it's even worse than this. And that's because you've heard the phrase, the, the wind doesn't always blow, the sun doesn't always shine. That's actually true. And then what that means is that if these power plants are built, their ability to produce electricity around the clock is much greater than, than renewables. So there's actually a pretty scary scenario we're talking about. And it's not just the big power plants, it's small ones too. Um, reforming the energy vision, you've, you've, heard, you've heard about reforming the energy vision. But there's a great push for distributed generation. And distributed generation can be, a, can be a good thing. That's what renewables can thrive in. But guess what? Gas competes really well in a distributed generation environment as well. And that's particularly scary when our state has policies and programs that actually encourage distributed generation without respect to where it's coming from. 
So what we're actually seeing is the transformation of the other energy system away from centralized uh, generation to distributed, but a lot of this gas. So power plants, 20, mega, 20 megawatt facility you're looking at right there. Below here is a, a pack of, of micro turbines. This would be potentially used in like a, an office or a commercial setting. Anyway, this is all moving in the wrong direction. And, and if you look at vehicles, the same thing. Uh, press <coughs> natural gas with 120 uh, press natural gas energy vehicle fueling stations in the country, I mean in, in the state, and that, that, that number continues to grow. And so we're seeing this as well in the vehicle. Um, um, and this graph is particularly this <coughs> I think, because it's telling you that we're burning more gas to move gas. This is an indication of the gas being burned within distribution systems and pipeline systems. This is compressor stations. This is the gas being burned in compressor stations to move, move, move more gas down the pipeline. And you can see that's accelerating. It's accelerating because we're building more pipelines and we're pushing mass more gas through them, to be used as an example. So, you know, so, so you might ask, well, well Keith, what, 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 are you, what are you possibly talking about? I mean, the state has a, has a great plan. We've heard all about the plan. It's a clean energy standard. It just came out of the, uh, a few months ago. And that's supposed to get us to 50% renewables by 2030. Doesn't that solve this problem? It doesn't. This is the situation. Today, let's look at our existing electricity portfolio. 26% uh, renewables. By the way, almost all of that, almost all of that is hydropower that's been with us for decades. Nuclear and fossil fuels. This is where the, the carbon footprint is, right over here in orange. How is, how is New York going to meet that 50% by 2030 goal? Well, that's what we got today. We, this is the other half of this pie that has to become green if we're going to get renewables for 50%. Well, the state's doing good things, right? Like there's a program called New York Sun, it's a 3,000 megawatt um, program. Um, that should do a lot for us, right? It does a little bit. Okay. What about the offshore wind uh, turbine, wind, wind farm that's being now talked about, and the governor's even talking about it? 700 megawatts. Uh, that's about 145 megawatt turbines. I guess you have. The point is, we got a long way to go. And we're not seeing the evidence that activity is occurring to fill out this pocket. What's it actually going to take? A lot more than 140 winter lines offshore of, of New York City. How about 2,000? Almost 2,000. How many do we have right now? Zero. Let's talk about onshore wind, because there have been some onshore uh, 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 wind farms that have been built. Well, we had a good surge of activity over here in 2007, 2008, but then it slapped, it slapped off. And it's plateaued and it's flatlined for the last three years. This is the reality of what's happening in New York State right now. We're not going in the direction we need to be. So the bottom line is, how does this relate to our goals? How does this relate to actually tackling the climate problem? What does this mean in terms of our greenhouse gas reduction, reduction objectives? The state's goal is to get to 80% reduction in total greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And the state energy plan says that we should get half of that by 2030, coming out of the energy sector. Well, you remember everything I showed you about that pie, okay, with <coughs> fossil fuels and nuclear and, and renewables? That was all electricity. The reality is electricity is only a small piece, or one piece, of our entire carbon footprint. Also on-site combustion. You know, I, I wasn't cold last night because I, I had the heat on in my house. Um, that's fossil fuels being burned. Probably all of us were doing that. Um, I think all of us got here by a car. So this is where the largest percentage of our carbon footprint is, is in these other things. And what's happening here? CES doesn't deal with that. The CES dealt with just electricity. And by the way, the impact of the CES was about that much. Okay? So we have a long way to go. It's not clear that the CES is going to get us there. And it's and, and it's, it's the real question is, what other things are happening in this arena? To achieve what needs to be done. And here's another clincher to be aware of. To solve these problems, to deal with on-site combustion, to get away from burning fossil fuels to heat your homes, to get into electric vehicles, 
that you know, these things require uh, conversion to systems that actually will require more electricity. So that piece of the pie has got to get better. And if we're going to make a dent in climate change, it can't be fossil fuels that, that produces that additional, additional electricity. It's got to be renewables. So the, the, the problem is none of that was considered in the communities. It was just looking at our existing electricity, uh, doing some projections of, uh, based on, on typical forecasts. Um, and what it takes to move these other sectors of our carbon footprint away from fossil fuels wasn't part of the equation. So ultimately, if we're going to succeed, a lot of these other areas have to be lighted out too by 2030 and ultimately by 2050. And by the way, you know, what I showed you here was the carbon footprint of fossil fuel combustion, CO2. And this to the future. <laughs> that thing, everything Bob told you, was to tell you about. Um, this is the picture we're facing. So it's kind of sober. So the question becomes, what actually can be done? And the good news is that there was a paper produced by the, by the two gentlemen that are here with me, um, and several other scientists, uh, that looked into the feasibility of actually getting us off of fuels, entire fossil fuels entirely. This is what it's going to take. Okay. Now, the state's goal is to 88% reduction, so it's not 100% reduction. But that means you're going to need about 80% of this stuff. Okay. So when I was talking about 2,000 wind turbines to fill out the CDS, scratch that. It's more like 16,000 if we're really trying to deal with fossil fuels across the board. So bottom line is we need a major course correction. We have to step up to reality. We need to see what's actually happening and what's not happening, own up to it, and make some major changes. First of all, let's not make things worse. We need to abandon the flawed policies and programs that are out there, policies that um, currently promote gas for heating and vehicles and encourage folks to convert to gas. That's a mistake. Um, and to, to um, promote distributed generation without respect to where that energy is coming from. Distributed energy, distributed generation from renewables is great. Distributed generation from gas is not. We need to stop approving more gas-fired power plants and infrastructure. And we need to develop a plan, a genuine plan, to phase out existing fossil fuel power plants and to phase out the end use consumption of fossil fuels for heating and transportation, the stuff I was talking about. Synchronous with that, and the word synchronicity is pretty important here because you, you got to plan for the downscaling of fossil fuels as you plan for the ramping up of renewables. You need to plan to get those renewables on scale and on time um, so, so that we can meet our energy needs. That means deploying renewables for wind, water, sun, coming up with the storage and grid enhancements that it's going to take to, 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 to address this, to, to make room for the additional electricity that we're talking about. I'm going to say when we go. Um, and then to install the electric, to have electric vehicles install the high efficiency heat pumps so that we can actually get off the fossil fuels. So, bottom line is New York actually, good news is New York actually has ample wind water and solar resources probably better than any other state. That's the good news. But to maximize that potential requires a technically feasible plan, ample public investment, and a commitment by leaders, political leaders, and agencies at every level of government. The bottom line is that banning high volume fracking within New York's borders while encouraging elsewhere won't solve the climate problem. We feel that Governor Cuomo can truly lead in the fight against climate change if we end New York's addiction to fossil fuels, including and especially shale gas, and uh, if the governor calls for a real plan that can meet our climate. summarize uh, where we were supposed to be decreasing our demand for fossil fuels and increasing our supply of renewables. What you just heard is that we're going in the exact opposite direction in both ways. We're, we're going the wrong way down a one-way street. You know what happens when that happens. So, uh, but I don't want to end on that negative note. You also heard that New York has ample resources to do a complete transition to renewable energy in our lifetimes, everybody in this room, including me. And it just takes a little bit more political will and a little bit more concern from Wall Street. 
and I should add one thing that hasn't come up, uh, less resistance from us. There's far too much resistance across New York State from the very same people who said no shale gas in my backyard are now saying no solar panels and no wind in my backyard. You can't have it both ways. Suck it up and be courageous. So with that, I want to open up for Q and A and uh, ask the question. We will repeat the question so it's recorded, and I'll direct the question to the appropriate answer. Who's first? Yes, sir. Well, this could go to any one of you, but you, I mean, you just said that it's going to take you know, more will from people and from policymakers, etc. But won't it take uh, public investment, which means you know money coming out of the pockets of taxpayers? And if that's true. How do you sell that to the public if it's going to raise taxes? The cost, if you look at the plan that we put forward, uh, the Jacobson Home Plan for 2030, fossil fuel free in New York, the price tag of that is substantial, but the price we're paying now for use of, of fossil fuels in terms of the externalities is also uh, amazing. This state spends tens of billions of dollars every year in health care costs and in premature deaths from people who are exposed to air pollution from using fossil fuels. And our plan showed that the over 20 year time period, the cost of going completely fossil free is actually less than what we're now spending just on those health care costs. Forget the climate change costs and forget what we're actually paying for fossil fuels. So it's a substantial amount of money, but it makes economic sense to go ahead and do it. And it's going to make increasingly uh, economic sense at the moment, uh, wind uh, is cost competitive with many types of, of uh, fossil fuels for new power plant construction. Uh, that will only become increasingly so as, as we move forward. And if we make the step now, in 10 or 20 years, we are leaders in the fossil fuel free world, then we'll have energy security here. We will have energy stability and pricing, which should be good for businesses. It creates a massive amount of jobs. There are more than three times as many jobs per dollar invested in renewable energy technologies in the fossil fuel industry. So it's actually good for the economy. We just need to get on with it. Can, can you address the, the kind of federal picture right now, the whole one question, are there any states now that currently ban the use of shale gas within their borders? And number two, the fact that right now, for the next four years, it's clear that the nation has a, a Administration is regulatory adverse. We've seen that in, of course, the, the new nominee to head the EPA. The fact that the Secretary of State is the you know head of, the head of Exxon, there does not appear to be a great deal of hostility or uh, or rigorous oversight when it comes to fossil fuel coming from at least the executive branch. So the first part of those questions, yeah. but the first part essentially was, are there any other states doing anything significant to a, against the use of shale gas, shale oil? And the second part is, what do we think is going to happen going forward in the regulatory arena, uh, given the tone of the appointments that are being proposed uh, for the key agents, federal agencies? So I'll, I'll take a stat of both of those, and then. Mm -hmm. So New York State is a leader. We're the only state in the country with significant shale gas resources that have said no. There are other states that have said no, but they don't have significant resources. So yeah, we'll be. Uh, but you just heard that we said no shale gas development in New York, but we're sucking up shale gas in Pennsylvania at a greater rate than, than ever seen before. Uh, so we, we can't say, wow, look at the states following us. Not yet. We haven't exhibited that kind of leadership. We're being hypocritical. On the second part, yeah, you're absolutely. But just to answer for a clear answer, are there any states that have banned the use of shale gas? Uh, Vermont. Yeah, Vermont. <laughs> I, 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 I tried to say Vermont does not have any shale gas. Does not have any shale oil, so it's a it's a nominal ban. They they banned drilling. Have they also banned its use in energy? No. 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 Okay, that's my question. Okay, no, no state, not even New York, has banned the use, the actual burning or emission of shale gas. Not even New York. No. Second part, you're absolutely correct. We should probably anticipate that over the next four years, those federal agencies that we have, we have come to rely on for regulatory protection are not going to be reliable. And what does that tell you? 
great. We're 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 a federal company, a country. We're not a we have fifty states that can do their own thing. And that what we're here telling you is that New York State should do its own thing. We can't rely on the EPA to protect us anymore. We have to rely on the DEC to protect us. We have to rely on the Department of Health to protect us. We have to rely on the governor to protect us, not the president. I've been talking to a lot of um, conservative groups since Donald Trump was elected, and they're saying that you know, it doesn't really matter what New York does because they're you know they're not going to follow the Paris Accord, and China and India are going to pollute. So if you put these kind of programs in, you're just you know hurting jobs and having really no effect. I'm wondering, I'm wondering what you guys think of that. Well, again, on jobs, there are more jobs in renewable energy mm -hmm. than in fossil fuels by a long way. So what about being you know just useless? Cleaning up the climate. Other countries are doing what they want. Well, other countries are doing what they want. I, I think China is showing some real uh, climate leadership. Quite frankly, they they are stepping up. They they are challenging the U.S. to stay with the COP21 agreements. They are international leaders in their rate of growth of sustainable energy. And so, you know, my fear, quite frankly, is is that uh, China will show huge leadership and become the, the the central country doing it right. And the United States will become a backwater. But I think we have a chance here in New York State and in California to show a, an alternative model for our, our country. Our economy here in New York is, is, is major. Our economy in California is major. And if you deconvolute the economy of the United States, we are the fifth and eighth largest economies in the world, respectively, in these two states. If these states show leadership and push ahead, it will make a big difference. And other states, I am convinced, will see that it is good for their economy. It's good for their citizens. It's good for jobs. It's good for energy pricing and business and energy security. So I think we should push ahead, set an example. And I honestly believe that it will be possible to still meet the COP21 uh, accords despite the incredible affairs that are going to be seen in Washington. Yeah. Uh, the only thing I would add, too, is that um, in the Jacobson plan, Another contributing author to that was Jeanette Barth, also from New York, and um, and and she pointed out uh, that renewables what was it three times more uh, in terms of job creation than, than fossil fuels. So there's tremendous gain to be had by really going for renewables here in our state. Um, on on the clean energy standard, you know the, the, the goal is to get 50 percent renewables. It doesn't specify where it has to come from. Um, one of my concerns is that we might be importing all of our renewable energy. We should be generating it right here in the state of New York. Mm -hmm. We have the potential, and uh, that's what's going to be creating the greatest uh, economic driver that we can have, bring people to business right here in our own state. So when it comes to uh, state policy, you hear different tones and different messages that seem to be almost conflicting when it comes from state policymakers, even within the same administration, and I'm referring to the state PSC, I think there was an official there in the NYSEG rate case. I wrote about it, I think somebody else wrote about it, referring to gas as clean fuel. And then meanwhile, Basil Segos from DEC saying climate change is the number one issue of our time. So is there a disconnect there, and what can be done about it if so? There's certainly, everybody heard that question. <laughs> is, the, is the disconnect that appears to exist within the higher levels of Albany real? Absolutely. That's one of the reasons we're having this press conference. It's one of the reasons I said that the politicians aren't listening to the scientists. Basil Sagos is correct. And what you heard today uh, puts a lie to the comment from the other person at BSE that says shale gas is a clean fossil fuel. No, it's not. We're all educators here. <laughs> we're not used to educating people in Albany, but that's what we're here to do. Keep in mind how, how recent the science is. I mean, literally, the paper that Tony and I put out five years ago, no one was paying attention to this idea of methane being important in the, in the greenhouse gas footprint of, of shale gas at that point in time. A lot of people challenged our work and questioned it early on, too. But at this point, I think there's a strong consensus on what I've said. Those satellite data I showed you are real. Those were published only two years ago. You know, it takes a while for this sort of information to completely get through the bureaucracy and various administrative levels, particularly when there's, you know, uh, discordant information coming from other sources. But the science is becoming quite, quite strong, and as it becomes so, I'm, I'm 
again, confident that the uh, officials of this uh, state will, will begin to speak more with one voice. I hope so. Let me add one, I'd like to add one more thing there. You, you've all heard the phrase putting lipstick on a pig. Um, it's relevant for your particular question. When you're faced with an issue where you can't do what you want to do, which is turn a switch on 1,700 offshore wind turbines and thousands of acres of solar panels that we don't have, then the only thing that you, the only game you have to play is natural gas. So you're going to put lipstick on that pig and say it's clean. But it's not. But the point is that we didn't have a plan in place 10 years ago. We didn't have a plan in place five years ago. We don't have a plan in place right now that would meet the synchronicity demands that Keith talked about. As we're decreasing our use of natural gas and coal, we have to be increasing the availability of, of renewables. And that brings into question the other, the other point, the other, the other brings into point the question you asked about, where's the money gonna come from? Wall Street is waking up. Wall Street is waking up. So is this a problem of um, the state doing things in the wrong way or the state not doing the right things uh, with the proper scope? Both. I mean, when, when, when you hear uh, agencies talk about gas and gas, well, it's not. So that's, those are weak macro statements that, that are taking us in the wrong direction. Um, in terms of the things that are happening, like the clean energy standard, you know, it, within the small box that it defines for itself, it uh, arguably could achieve things with a lot of work, but the small box doesn't address the big picture. The big picture, like I, like I was pointing out, is electricity um, is, uh, is about a quarter of our total carbon footprint. We need to tackle, we need to tackle the other things too. Are you aware of the uh, Climate and Community Protection Act? And if so, what do you think of its, its ability to address some of the problems that you've talked about? Uh, we are aware of it. Um, the, the, the folks up here have, uh, have tried to weigh in on that. Um, we've we've uh, expressed concerns about aspects of the proposed bill. Um, what, what Tony has been saying, what, what Tony just said about the need to have a serious plan that actually gets you to off of fossil fuels. That means synchronicity between ramping up on renewables as you're scaling down on fossil fuels. Um, we don't see that in the, in the plan as currently proposed. Um, so to ultimately, if you're going to do something bold, if you're going to, like getting rid of all fossil fuels, um, like getting to zero emissions, which is what the clean, uh, which is what the, the proposed bill purports to do. There's a lot of work to, to accomplish that. That needs to be articulated in the bill. So we, we don't see that yet. Oh, uh, just a couple more comments to the piece on the CCPA. Um, the intent of the bill is laudable. Anybody with a soul who reads the first couple pages of that bill has tears in their eyes. We're talking Hamilton here. We're talking, this is America. <laughs> but when you get into the technical details, as Steve points out, we, we found a couple of problems with it, and we're trying to address those problems. Um, and the, the key issue is, and we've said this a couple times already today, politicians in Albany don't understand yet, haven't been educated yet, on the scope of energy in New York State. We're logging the first hundred and so offshore wind turbines. Well, we need a hundred more like that between now and 2030. Where's the plan? How do we know when that's going? To, how do we know when the confluence of Wall Street capital, community acceptance, and political will are going to combine to allow that hundred times what we don't yet have to occur in time to meet the climate problem? So. Yeah, we'd like to see the CCPA make it this time, but we'd like to see modifications to it on the technical side. All the rest of it is beautiful. You keep mentioning the offshore wind turbines. I mean, so the, the first piece of that is the, the federal auction that's coming up. The New Yorker State is also working on a master plan for 
presumably bigger development of offshore wind. Is that not going in the direction you want? I mean, do you see it just not coming quickly enough? The question is, um, is New York moving fast enough with the, with the planning? And, and we're not aware of, of anything at, at the scale that's required, is the bottom line. So yes, it's a step in the right direction. The, the Jacobson are all plan that we put out called for roughly half of the total energy in the future of the state coming from offshore wind. In other words, it's the, it's the biggest resource we have in the state that's easiest to get. And so we really need to push ahead with it. The state is starting to move slowly in that direction, but it really needs to do a lot more. And a lot more quickly. You know, I think it's important to recognize that when you're talking about setting goals and possibly meeting goals or possibly not meeting goals, um, the, 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 you know, the, the consequences of not meeting your goals is, is not just that you, know, you didn't get the number you wanted. It means we're going to be burning more gas. That's the consequence of not stepping up to the plate and doing what needs to be done. It appears that even as we've been talking here, the EPA has released its report on <coughs> the uh, impact of fracking on... It's a great solution to the wrong problem. <laughs> I'm sorry, what is we, we, we spent hundreds of millions of dollars in five years uh, on that EPA study, and it was it's a beautiful study to the wrong problem. Fracking is not the problem. It's everything that comes before fracking and after fracking, like we talked about today. That that report does has not a single word in it that addresses anything we spoke about today. Totally irrelevant, orthogonal, as an engineer would say. So five years great effort, wonderful people working on it, um, and the conclusion is what we knew at the very beginning. There's a very small likelihood that fracking per se, that few hours when a gas well or oil well is actually fracked, is going to have a significant impact on human health. It does not address anything that comes before or afterwards, all of which has profound effect on human health. Is the EPA working on methane studies? Uh, the EPA... <laughs> Which EPA? <laughs> the, yeah. the outgoing EPA has proposed new methane rules and has proposed a clean power plan, which obviously has impact in the methane arena. Uh, the likelihood that either those rules or that clean power plan are ever going to see real enforcement at this point in the next four years, very low. Is it cold? Just, just one comment on, on what EPA has done today. <laughs> Because they, they have tried to put regulations forward to deal better with the methane, but and I could I could nitpick it around the edges, but but fundamentally the regulations are based on industry self-reporting, and I do not accept that as a, a, a reliable way to do this. Industry you know, has no real incentive to uh, be, be truthful, quite frankly, and so we need a, uh, a much more robust regulatory structure for this whole industry. In, in response to your answer about the CCPA bill uh, a few questions ago, uh, just for clarification, you seem to indicate that they sought no input from people such as yourself, any scientific input on crafting this bill. If that's the case, can you possibly explain why they did not? The, the, the question is, have uh, technical experts been sought? Mm -hmm. um, uh, there was a, a statement about uh, self-reporting. Um, that actually is, is an, an issue with the bill you're talking about as well. Um, one of the things that we've been saying is that to get a handle on what emissions are, to measure progress, we need to keep track of it with a robust annual assessment that looks at the whole gamut of things. Self-reporting, you know, you could argue that that could be a uh, one piece of, of, what, of, the, of what informs your analysis of what our emissions are on an annual basis, but it can't be the only piece. It certainly, it certainly needs to be verified, um, and there's scientific research that has to go into you know, field analysis of what leakage actually occurs in the pipeline systems, not just generally in the country, but here in New York State. That kind of analysis needs to go into a robust report to really get a handle on what our greener, greenhouse gas emissions are. Um, if, if you want, there's actually a, a slide I could jump back to um, that I think is relevant. We had a couple extra slides if people ask good questions on you are. We didn't plan that question. <laughs> no. But but um let me see if I can find this. Alright. That's my extra slide. Um, the state has a greenhouse gas inventory report 
that comes out with four. the wrong numbers in their yes. ability to calculate Maybe. greenhouse gas? Um, the question was, is NYSERDA using the wrong numbers in coming up least? Then, how do we compare methane and carbon dioxide? And we use this thing called the global warming potential. Basically, methane, when it's in the atmosphere, is 105 times more potent than carbon dioxide. If methane stays in the air for only 12 years, carbon dioxide will stay in the air for centuries. So you need to compare them over some time frame. If you pick a 100-year time frame, it greatly discounts the problem of methane at shorter time periods. And again, Jim Hansen is telling us that the unprecedented warming we're seeing over the last few years is because of methane. If you average that 100 years into the future, it doesn't look like a big deal, but it is a big deal. So a lot of us are saying we should use a shorter <coughs> time period. On top of that, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is sort of the international scientific consensus building behind this, are the ones who produce these numbers. Even at the 100-year time period, they've been telling us since 2013 that that number is too low. And EPA has simply, and the state, have simply refused to come up to date with the science. That number is about 15 years old. Can, can you go back to the graph, I think it was about in your, in your presentation, the Schindel graph from NASA that, that brings home why this time frame question is so important. What's the question again? Yeah, uh, we've been asked to bring back the graph produced by uh, Drew Shindell and his colleagues uh, at NASA, which I'm getting right there. And you have a question about how we should use this graph to emphasize the time issue? Yeah. The, 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 the point is, as we look into the future of warming here, if we do nothing with greenhouse gas emissions, we're on that trajectory. If we reduce carbon dioxide emissions but ignore methane, we're on that trajectory because there are 30-year lags in how the climate responds to carbon dioxide. We need to reduce carbon dioxide because we need to start pulling this down. Where are those tipping points? But the only way to keep on these trajectories is to control methane. This is if you do methane and soot alone. This is if you do methane, soot, and carbon dioxide, which is what we want to do. So if we reduce methane emissions, we can slow the rate of global warming now. We buy decades of time before we start to hit these tipping points, right? We cannot do it with CO2 alone. The time frame over which we're going to meet this tipping point, if we do nothing, is six to ten years. When we compare CO2 and methane over a hundred year time period, we're averaging that effect way up to here, which is extremely misleading. Is, so one of, the, one of the graphs here shows, you know, coal versus natural gas in terms of methane plus carbon dioxide right. there. That would seem to me that why shouldn't we emphasize coal more? Shale gas has more of an impact if all that methane is in the atmosphere. So the question is, given the comparisons among shale gas, coal, petroleum, it appears that uh, shale gas is a loser, but coal is a winner. So why not just switch back to coal? And the answer is that we need to get rid of shale gas because of the short-term methane need. We need to slow the warming immediately. But that carbon dioxide is more than from you know, this, this immediately stop it. No. What we've been saying is we have to manage two problems simultaneously. This word synchronicity. You manage the decrease in the use of fossil fuels, especially shale gas. By manage, I mean politically, economically, and by our own individual demands. At the same time, you're managing the increase in deployment of uh, renewable energy. That's, that's a rational approach to doing things. That's the basis for a plan. It has two parts. Drop this over some time increase this over some time, remembering that the time that we have to do it mm -hmm. is about a decade. Uh, I, have, I have two questions. One is fairly specific and definitely w within your ken of science. The other is very quite general and you may just, you know, reduce or get into it. But uh, the one is specific is on storage, it, it, uh, on uh, energy storage. And I'm thinking specifically of uh, solar storage. And there seems to be a bottleneck or a lock there at the moment um, in that area. And uh, do you see any breakthrough coming? Binghamton University was just announced that they got a two and a half million dollar grant to study lithium ion batteries and try to improve them. Do you, are you aware of any 
to advance in that. The other question is much more general, and that is overriding all this discussion for people like me, who are certainly lay people and not scientists, is the issue of science being right and 97.2% uh, in, in agreement on these things that you're talking about, but yet, uh, politically, and in terms of public consciousness, and uh, the last election is pretty much pointing this out, I think, uh, you're in, in, in deep, hot water here for, for years. And how, what kind of a gap can we afford, just politically, uh, as looking ahead? Okay, thank you for that memory test for a 16 year old. <laughs> so the first, the first question was very specific. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to flunk this. Uh, the first question was very specific, having to do with what about the issue of storage for renewable energy? You know, the sun doesn't shine all the time, the wind doesn't blow all the time, so how do you store energy when it's being created from a new renewable source so that you can use it when it's not available? The second question was the general question of how about this disconnect between what science is saying about climate change and what some politicians and a very large segment of a certain part of the population is saying about climate change. Isn't that leading us into uh, some sort of uh, dissonance uh, on a societal level? Those are the questions. Who wants to do the first one? <laughs> no, I passed the test for remembering. <laughs> <laughs> Storage is an important part of, of the energy future because the sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow. But load management, smart grids are, are a big part of that. Accurate forecasts of the wind uh, domain and the uh, weather so you know exactly what you're going to get for solar and wind and use it optimally. As we use more and more uh, electric cars, the average electric car is actually only using about uh, 15% of its battery charge per day uh, in, in driving, and so there's a huge capacity of surplus batteries there. If we have two-way communications with smart grids, there's some studies showing that's a significant amount of storage. There are other ways to store electricity, including electrolysis. Pump storage, flywheels. Yeah, flywheels, pump storage, pump, uh, yeah. compressed air. And the Jacobson plan uh, was based entirely on technologies that were commercially available as of four years ago. And so, you know, the technologies are going to get better and better, and they'll make it cheaper and cheaper, and that's good, but we don't have to wait. And then the analogy I like to make is, you know, in this country, we went from horse-drawn carriages to automobiles as a major mode of transportation. We did that about 15 to 20 years, you know, back in the early 20th century. And the first cars looked like horse-drawn carriages, still had reins for steering, got rid of the horses, they had pulleys, and the brakes were a lever you pulled against them. We didn't wait for rack and pinion steering and disc brakes to build the automobile. We start in the transition, and then the technology's improved. And that is what we need to do for this energy revolution. Second part of your question, it is extremely depressing to be a climate scientist. I have worked on climate science since the 1970s. My first major job after I got my PhD was to teach a climate change course with uh, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, MIT, and Woods Hole. Uh, that was back in 1980. Uh, our greenhouse impact on the planet has doubled in the time I've been teaching it, so I'm clearly not a very effective teacher. And, and yeah, it's, uh, it's, I don't have uh, optimism. I will tell you that the climate denial movement is a recent thing. You know, back in the 1990s, Republicans believed in climate change much more than they do now, and it's an American phenomenon. You know, I travel a lot, and people in the rest of the world, everyone believes in climate change. It's a U.S. phenomenon, it's a manufactured phenomenon, and yes, it's extremely distressing. Excuse me, I presume you're all familiar with the writer C.P. Snow about 50 years ago? Remember C.P. Snow? Well, you Google yeah. C.P. Snow. It was pretty much like prediction, this collision of, uh, of uh, science and science educated and the uh, non-science and non-science. Uh, now we've been given a, a, a literature test. <laughs> <laughs> I've read C.P. Snow. I think I'm vaguely familiar with the yeah. book you're talking about, but I, I take it as an assignment. But all three of us will be reading it over the weekend. <laughs> Good point. No, you're, you're right. There, there are precedents in history and in the literature for what we're seeing today. We will get through this. Yeah, on, on the storage issue, I, I'm not sure it was mentioned, uh, that that when you're making that transition, hopefully to 100% um, fossil fuel free, um, it's uh, 
when you're when you, when you're approaching that 50 percent mark, you can do a lot with the motion, the, the, the load management that, that Bob was talking about. After you hit 50 percent, you want more renewables than that. That's that's where the, the storage really kicks in as, as something you need to have. But you can do a lot actually with the load management that, that Bob was talking about. Um, so anyway, I just want to that. Yeah, and, and one more thing about the, the storing the energy. You don't have to store the energy if the wind isn't blowing on Long Island, but the wind is blowing up in the northwestern part of the state or in the northern part of the state, as long as you have a grid that will efficiently take that energy from where it's being produced to where it's not being produced. We haven't figured out how to stretch New York State so the sun is always shining in. <laughs> but we'll work on it. Yeah. New York, New York has had, um, we have this nuclear subsidy that's being put in place. You didn't have in your graph any uh, section for nuclear subsidy in the point. We didn't want this question. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I have to ask it. Um, so what role do you think nuclear should play in New York's energy future? And what do you think of the nuclear subsidy? So the question is, what role do we think nuclear energy should play in uh, New York's future? And what do we think of the recently announced subsidy to keep some of the nuclear power plants currently operating in New York State operating for some time in the future. Um, oh boy. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm formulating that the, the issue of having a plan is important here. So I, I'm going to take a chance. I know I'm going to regret this. Uh, I'm using an example of not having a plan. There it is. There's the example. There are many people in New York State would like, that would have liked to have those nuclear power plants shut down as soon as possible. Not turned off tonight, but as soon as possible. And if we do that, people are going to freeze in the dark. Because we don't have the renewable energy ready to deploy to replace the electricity coming from those plants. Well, why didn't we? Poor planning on our part 10 years ago. Poor planning on, okay, if we had implemented the Jacobson plan 2012, we might have been able to shut one of those plants down by now. We might have had enough wind energy, we might have had enough solar energy in order for us to shut down one or more of those plants. But here's an example of poor planning leads to less than ideal compromises, where in this case $7 billion of ratepayer and taxpayers' dollars are going to be paying for shareholders, dividends. That's the money exchange that's going to occur. And our leadership, our economic and political leadership, allowed that to happen because they weren't willing to face the music 10 years ago and say, let's have a plan so we can shut those plants down. All right, map that into the future. What's the next thing that's going to happen? We're going to have to shut the plants down sometime in the near future, five years from now, 10 years from now. We're going to, are we going to repeat this by saying, oh, all right, we still don't have enough offshore wind turbines, onshore wind turbines, and acres and thousands of acres of, of solar panels. So. Let's build some more CPVs all around the state. <coughs> Did we learn our lesson? Rhetorical question. Mm -hmm. um, even with all the build out of renewables, and there's a hope mm -hmm. and optimism towards that um, around the state, uh, as an example, in, in the entire Northeast, we're also seeing that. Build-out of infrastructure is really not meant for local use, domestic use. Mm -hmm. It's really heading for um, export, and it's not about energy dependence. It's for profit. And so, how do we address that issue? Because we're seeing, even with uh, a massive build-out in the Northeast, of, for example, the Spectra East Pipeline, and if there are two more expansions of that same pipeline. Uh, millions and millions of tons of greenhouse gas emissions from multiple pressure stations and other infrastructure and other uh, health impacts and climate impacts. The Massachusetts Attorney General said they don't need the gas. They, they're all set. They don't need it. It's all headed for Canada for export overseas. So we're scrambling here to do all this, which we still have to do, but how do we uh, deal with that. Yeah, so I, I think the, I think the question was if, if you uh, with, with the optimism that's that's happening about 
making some, making some changes, um, that in, in the potential for making changes, does it really matter when a lot of this gas is being exported? This kind of, and, and how do we factor that into this? Well, how do we transport? It does matter that we make the changes right, right. for the new Right, right, right. Um, I, I think it's important that um, we don't oversimplify the, the, the situation. Um, the fact is, um, exports are a piece of it. Um, that is part of the, the driving, the economic aspect of it. The companies want to make more money because they can sell it overseas. Um, by the way, when, once they deplete our resources here, they'll be happy to reverse those pipelines and import gas again. We'll be dependent on foreign fuel again um, when we frack the rest of the world. That's obviously the, the that, that, that's, I, see, I hear what you're saying. But um, a lot of the use of gas that's driving this is also domestic. I mean, the, the, the pictures that I showed, the graphs that are of the consumption in New York State, um, also in the Northeast, the main pipeline is, is being sent to power, new power plants that are being built up the line, right, in New England. So it, we're part of the problem. We are part of the problem. Okay. Just, just as, as part of the export issue, I thought I was in uh, Brussels earlier in the fall, because there's a large interest in, in Europe in uh, natural gas. They also are expanding their use of natural gas. There's a big interest in using less Russian gas and getting it more from elsewhere. And so there's an interest in importing fracked gas from the U.S. There's an interest in getting fracked gas from Morocco, et cetera. And there are dozens and dozens of organizations and hundreds of activists who are concerned about that. So they had a summit to try and figure out what to do about it. In Europe, the, the argument uh, that they're hearing from industry is that the sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow, so we need natural gas as a backup. And of course that's false. It's, it's plain and simple false. So the activists are trying to get that messaging through, and I, you know, I think we should try and give them our support. But if the markets to which we export dry up, which they should, then they help solve the problem too. Yes, how are we doing on time, by the way? I think we're okay. Maybe we're okay. Maybe. Okay. Yes. Um, so y'all are on a, a really formidable team, and y'all are lucky here. Do you have any sense of, of uh, confidence or optimism about your message? You've consolidated a lot of information, the most current information in your research, putting it out there to connect the dots. Do you have any confidence about your message really hitting home with our DEC? with the comptroller, with the PSC, and with the governor. Because the disconnect that Mr. Mahoney referred to before is not just between agencies, it's within the agency. You know, I've heard engineers at the DEC say shell gas, you know, clean energy. We, we gotta use gas, it's a bridge. So, uh, there's two, disconnect. Yeah, two parts to that question. <laughs> One, do we agree that we're an awesome team? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> And then the second part of the question is... Uh, Does it make any difference? Do we have optimism that our messaging, not just what we said today, but what we've said in the things that we've written for the last four or five years and all the talks that we give all across the state, do we have an, uh, an optimism that the message is having an effect not only between agencies but within agencies in the government, in, including all the ones you mentioned? Um, well, we, we made this a press conference because we wanted the press to hear the message because we thought that the press would get the message out where people in those agencies would read it because we know that people in those agencies do not come to our talks. <laughs> yeah, darn. Um, so am I optimistic that we're getting through? Yeah, I have to be. Otherwise, there's no reason to keep on doing it. Um, we're getting through, but does that mean that our message being heard will have an implementable effect? Will, will DEC, DOH, PSC, NYSERDA do things resulting from the research that we do? We hope so. I, I'm optimistic. Go ahead. I just want to say that, you know, that's why we put the hard reality up there. Because ultimately, if we're going to be making progress and in, in, in accomplishing something here, all of us, activists, uh, agencies, we need to own up to what it's actually going to take. 
Okay, so so we showed you some really hard numbers to swallow, and and it, 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 it but but that's what we need to be talking about because that's what it's going to take to accomplish this, and and so it's going to be important for all of us to understand that as we advocate for doing our thing. Could the three of us write uh, Governor Cuomo's next State of the Union address? <laughs> or be asked the part of that State of the Union address that has to do with climate change and energy in New York State? Yeah, we could write it. We could send it to him. Would he read it? Can you do it a try? Yeah, I would give it a try. Yeah. Yeah, give it a try. So, so we talked about the agencies, and you mentioned Governor Cuomo. What about the other elected officials, our legislators, the people who actually write our energy policy, our public policy? When somebody proposes a bill to them, do they reach out to the scientists? Do they call you and say, hey, Tony, somebody's got this bill before me. What do you think of it? Do you think it's going to actually um, you know, address our climate issues or not? So do legislators in New York State, the people who actually write and vote on the bills, reach out to people like us and ask for consultation? Uh, or even, even further than that, ask for advocacy? Uh, some do, in my opinion. From my experience, some do. Most don't. Some definitely do, uh, and it's, there's no point in naming specifics now. But but there are uh, there are some uh, good legislative uh, leaders, I would say, who, who do try and make sure the science is right. Do reach out to people like us, uh, and there's there's some events that I think are encouraging. Just over a year ago, uh, something with Engelbright, who chairs the assembly's uh, what they call roundtable on climate, invited me and a handful of other uh, experts to come and talk to him and uh, six other assembly people, and we spent five hours. I, mean, I, I, I go from Ithaca thinking I was in for a half hour, but because he's a busy guy, but no, he's interested. And, and I think there are other people truly interested. So that, that's part of what gives my some of Maybe one more? Uh, a quick question. Your charts that show the carbon equivalents and the methane leakage projections, do those include the projections of methane leakage from the extraction areas? So that includes a component of methane leakage from the gas that's used in New York, but also what it costs to extract it in Pennsylvania. Uh, the question is, in the calculations in the graphs and charts that we've shown where we're trying to quantify leakage rates for methane, does it include everything, the whole life, what we call the whole life cycle, from the time the first bulldozer shows up to create a pad to the time the gas either gets vented or burned? And the answer is yes, as best we can. Uh, you want to add to that? Yeah, just, just a little, yes, it certainly does. So say in this figure, it includes emissions all the way from the well site to final consumer. So this is the way you can view, if, if you are using those fuels, this is your impact on the planet. So it doesn't have a geographic specificity, but specific to the consumption. So may I have one quick follow-up question, and that is, what is the answer that you would give to the people who say, well, we can control that orange line, the methane leakage, through regulation? I mean, they believe, you know, the oil and gas industry will say, well, it's valuable to us, too. We're doing everything we can because it's, that's where our profit is. But we're going to control those leaks through better technology. The uh, question is, what do we say to those who say that the industry does that every, everything it can to reduce uh, inadvertent leakage and purposeful venting uh, because it's in their best economic interest to do so. Uh, again, my emotional outburst is that's BS. Um, okay, in the best of times, when natural gas was selling for $14 per thousand cubic feet, an argument could be made that for every 1,000 cubic feet that you don't vent or you don't leak, there's a potential for $14 of sales. Well, the last time I looked, the price of natural gas is about $3. And the regulatory <laughs> impetus uh, has diminished uh, nationwide, in, including in Pennsylvania and New York State. Uh, and no, no less than senior vice presidents of major oil and gas companies have testified before the Congress of the United States on this exact issue. A senator, I can't remember his name, uh, someone New England states asked the vice president of Southwestern Energy, why are you leaking all this gas? Why are you venting? Why are you venting all that gas? It's a valuable commodity. 
And his answer was, well, in a, tight, in a time of tight monetary conditions, you have to choose where you're going to spend each dollar. And if we're going to spend a dollar putting new equipment on the site, or putting new controls on the site, or putting new uh, personnel going out finding and fixing leakage, or put that extra dollar into drilling another well. That was the answer he gave in the Congress of the United States. So there it is in the horse's mouth. Uh, so that, that's, no, I, I don't believe for a moment, as some NGOs are, have been saying for years, that with just a little bit of twisting of the arm, we can get the entire oil and gas industry to tighten up millions, millions of leaks across a very complex system ranging from well sites all the way to end users, merely for economic reasons. They should be doing it for life support reasons. They should be doing it for their kids. You know, this, this touches upon the subject of externalized costs. Um, the, the, the fact that uh, the way uh, the, the economy is structured is that those costs that we all bear, health costs and so forth, aren't factored into the decision making of, of, of corporations that, that are doing this drilling. They're deciding it's in their profit interest to, to let them make they leak, especially when you're talking about $3. So um, somehow, um, I think part of the solution has got to be a way of internalizing those those externalized costs, and so that so that uh, the cost of fuel uh, does end up reflecting uh, the burden it puts on society. So we have one last question. One more. Yes, sir. Just have a minor comment. My iPhone just told me that Rick Perry is not an enemy. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Is that good news? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's not a question. Yeah. <laughs> so we collectively want to thank you all, especially those of you who helped arrange this press conference, all of you who attended. It's been, they've been a great audience for asking all the right questions. So go out and do good. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Thank you.